speaker here, uh, Smita, can you have you up, please? So, so Smita is is from Exotel, the sponsors over there. Um, she is uh, a grad of Ohio State. She's got a master's in CS. She's worked uh, at a Bay Area startup that was later acquired by Cisco. Uh, and uh, she's been an RJ and a dancer, I believe. That is right. And uh, she is the organizer of the India chapter of Women Who Go. So she does a lot of community stuff as well. And she's going to talk about uh, the context lib and go. Yes? Yes, that's right. I get correct. all of that right? Yes. So can we have a hand for <laughs> Smita, please? Thank you. OK, over to you. Thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. OK, great. Thank you. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I will dive right into the topic. So this morning I speak about uh, Ghost Context Library. Um, and uh, this is what is on the agenda. So I start off with a, a brief introduction uh, as to exactly what is context management in distributed systems and why it is a non-trivial problem to solve. Uh, we will look at Ghost Context Library and how it tries to solve, uh, offer a possible solution. Uh, we should look at some example use cases and finish off with some points to watch out for when you are evaluating the use of this library. So, a brief introduction. What do our typical distributed systems look like? So, um, we've talked about microservices uh, architecture in this conference and um, it looks like something like this. This is not complex enough, but then typically a distributed system has a lot of services interacting with one another. There are requests uh, being sent out to other services, responses being uh, accepted, and then the data is processed, and then um, downstream uh, services might be notified of other responses. So typically, there is a lot of uh, activity happening within the system. So uh, let's consider a pipe, uh, a, a more uh, flow-like uh, design. So A here accepts a request from the outside world. And in order to process that request, it needs some information from an upstream service. So it contacts B with a request. Uh, and then B, again, in order to service this, might uh, have another derived request going upstream and so on, till um, one of the upstream ser services is able to respond to uh, uh, the first downstream server, and uh, D now has the entire information, so it processes and sends a response back to C and all the way to A. So typically, imagine a distributed system uh, having a lot of microservices. Uh, uh, there might be millions of such concurrent uh, uh, requests leading to their own derived requests and leading to an entire flow. Uh, there might be cases where these um, need to pass information, some kind of information, uh, with respect to a request, which also get carried in the derived requests, right? So typically, uh, there might be cases like uh, security credentials that you might need to pass on, or a request ID, uh, or user ID, or some kind of identification, some kind of value that you would want to pass uh, in the request, in all subsequent derived requests, in all the uh, responses that come back, so that you can do something um, associated with that request. So this is what is meant by a context. A context, uh, typically in English, um, would be, hey, uh, anything that triggered, triggered a flow, you sort of map it end to end, uh, all the way from A to the, uh, the last upstream uh, server, and then back all the way. So then, uh, exactly what do we mean by Go's context? So Go defines a context type. Uh, this context, typically, like we've seen, uh, can carry some information. Now, what kind of information are we looking for? We're looking for um, can, uh, deadlines. Deadlines are uh, defined 
a, a time stamp in the future which says, at this point in time in the future, the request ceases to hold any uh, relevance. So anything beyond this time, I really don't care about the response. You know, There might be other cancellation signals. Hey, uh, your request was, let's say, for example, sent out to three servers. The first response was received. For the other two, you basically don't care. You don't want to hold yourself um, waiting for all the three servers. You're OK with, with um, an OR condition. There might be other values, like I just indicated, values like um, related to the context itself, some kind of security information, credentials, ID, and so on. Now, ghost context um, is, is good in, in a way that it works across API boundaries and across processes. Uh, typically, uh, in today's, so uh, Samir uh, pointed out uh, in his earlier talk that um, their motivation for this library was you know, there were, there were far too many uh, context management uh, happening all over the place. You know, uh, sockets do their own context management, file systems need to do their own, uh, own uh, uh, management, servers need to do their own management. Why not integrate everything? You know, everybody uses a, uh, a set format in order to do whatever is required in, in the context. Clean up or cancellation or you're sending across some value everything under the same umbrella. So this library is an effort to provide that one umbrella where all the information is, is sort of stored within that context, and anybody who receives that can work against it. So um, I'm dwelling in the, d the details of exactly how the context is defined in the library. It has exactly four methods. Uh, the methods are a done method, which uh, is set. It's, a, it's basically a channel, a receive-only channel, which is closed when the context is either canceled or its deadline expires. So when this channel is set, the context ceases to have, uh, ceases to, uh, have any relevance at all. So it can be discarded. Uh, there's an error method which uh, is set, which indicates why the done channel was closed. And this is only set when the done channel is set. And today it holds only two possible values. One could be, uh, one is uh, uh, either uh, it was explicitly canceled, or the second being the deadline has expired, therefore the done channel was closed. Only two possible values today. Uh, deadline. Deadline is a, a, t a timestamp, an absolute time in the future when this context will expire. And therefore, anybody who's interested in cleaning up stuff may uh, do it at, at that point in time. Uh, value. Value is, um, uh, is an optional key value identifier. It's just a key value pair. Value is optional. And um, anything that you would, any information, any, uh, like I talked about, any user credentials, anything specific to this context that you would pass, want to pass to uh, other APIs, uh, other processes, you can use uh, this to set the value against a particular context. So what are the primary use cases? Now, we've dwelt upon this. We've just touched, so we'll just make it clear in points. Um, this is used for distributed tracing. So distributed tracing, like we said, a, a distributed system, a lot of requests in flight. Some of them are related. Some of them are not related. So, uh, so if uh, for debugging purposes, for tracing purposes, uh, one would like to uh, sort of f follow a flow through a request, look at what it did uh, to the upstream servers, um, uh, what its flow was like, what responses it, uh, it sent back, whether it hit an error, whether so anything related to debugging, for example, in a distributed system, this is highly useful because then you're tagging a particular request with a request identifier, and you follow through that request identifier through your logs, uh, just sort of type it in, say, Elasticsearch or something, and you get everything that happened on that request, request ID. So it'll sort of cover your entire flow in the system. Request cancellation. Now, uh, request cancellation, uh, like we've uh, seen, could be either time-based or an explicit cancel function. Actually, we've not seen this, but uh, just to add, request cancellation in uh, a ghost context library could be of two types. One is an absolute timestamp in the future, like I said, 
uh, deadline. And one is an explicit cancel function which can be invoked against a context. Uh, so let's assume the work is done and you heard back from one, one of the servers, you explicitly say, hey, cancel all the other requests which are pending because I already got my answer. The third is a context value which might be associated, uh, like I said, an optional key value pair. So these are uh, the primary use cases that uh, the, the context library helps us with. So a very basic, uh, uh, is it a, okay, so this slide is just three lines. It just says that a possible context value, and this is just an example for uh, distributed tracing, could be a request ID, a unique uh, request identifier. For example, uh, we've used uh, uh, UUIDs, 128-bit unique identifiers, in order to set the context value, which will uniquely identify the flow across the system for us. So getting back to the library, uh, there are broadly four kinds of context nodes that one may uh, use when um, uh, taking help uh, of this library. The first one always starts with a, co uh, with a background node. So a background node basically is the root node of a context tree, and um, it typically starts off uh, all the, uh, the requests and the related requests. A value node is one in which the context node is associated with a key and an optional value pair. A cancelable node, again, could be either deadline or one which may have an explicit cancel function associated with it. And a to-do node is um, one which is future extensible. So you want to make your APIs compatible with context, but today you don't use context, is when you would typically use this. But then uh, we'll try and cover the first three in a little more depth. So this is what a typical context tree would look like. It would uh, start with a context, uh, uh, background context. Again, background context is an empty uh, context node. It has no useful information other than just starting the context tree. Uh, no deadlines, no cancellations, no error, nothing. Then a second level might be derived uh, by using this uh, parent, the root node, and invoking it with a with cancel, with value, with timeout, with deadline, uh, four optional uh, functions. So if you want an explicit cancel function, you would use a with cancel. If you want to set some kind of a value, uh, derive the root node with a value, you would use a with value, and so on. So B would return an explicit cancel function, which might be invoked to cancel B explicitly. Similarly, a, a third level could be derived by the, the first level uh, parent. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the second level, uh, and then explicitly you could invoke the same kind of uh, hierarchy. So now I uh, will cite a little more complex example. And before I start off with it, uh, I will give you a, a brief about what this uh, example is going to be about. It is about something, uh, it is about actually using a context, associating a deadline with it in the future, and ha uh, processing your request uh, through an up upstream API, and getting the results within the uh, deadline, failing which the context shall be uh, closed, the done channel shall be closed, it shall be caught, and uh, the application is free to do its cleanup. So that is what the example is about. So uh, there are going to be um, majorly three packages, at least three packages. Now, I um, have a util package. I called it util initially, and then uh, remembered util was a bad uh, uh, name for a package. So I changed it to user ID. This is more explicit about what the package does. So uh, it's a user ID package, which um, indicates that it is uh, working with the user ID the user ID could be used as a context value. Therefore, uh, I have defined a set and a get on the context value. And what it does is it uh, says the context key type is a user ID. It could be, uh, so basically, context key generally uh, is, uh, uh, is visible within the context of a package only. This is to make sure that there are no collisions across other packages which might want to set their own uh, context values and context key. So this is one such uh, package. 
So it says the context key that I will define here is a user ID, and then you do a set on a user ID and a get from um, uh, the context, and you get the user ID back. So again, um, the main thing to note here is uh, you know uh, with value, and these are basically interfaces. So you can pass any kind of value. I'm just making uh, it trivial by uh, passing an integer value, but it could be anything. So. So these are values associated with the context. Uh, again, uh, uh, I will just mark out the important things. So start request. Start request is the one which is the downstream uh, uh, API, uh, the downstream service, which wants to make an API call. So start request, what it will start off with uh, is it's going to associate, it's going to uh, initiate a, a context. Uh, it's going to create a context tree, uh, starts off with the background node, says on the background node, associate a timeout value, which is equal to the delta t which is specified. So the subtle difference between with deadline and with uh, timeout is just that with deadline specifies, takes an absolute value in the future as a value, uh, uh, as, as an input, and with timeout really takes the delta t, so which is added to the now time and then you and the deadline is set. So basically they are uh, the same intrinsically, but they take different value, uh, parameters. So with timeout here is taking the delta t value within which you want to uh, sort of get the response or you don't care about it. A defer cancel. Now this uh, is an explicit cancel function which is invoked. If uh, a response is received within the timeout period, uh, you want to explicitly go uh, say, I don't care about anything else which is pending. Uh, you just say, um, before I exit, just make sure that you uh, uh, cancel the function and everybody else who's doing their own thing gets to know that uh, their response is not needed. At some other point, um, we do a set context value. Now, on the timeout value which is associated, so this is the background is the root, First level is the uh, with timeout. The second level is going to be the set context. Now, set context is actually associating the, uh, the uh, timed context with a value, which in this case is a user ID. So uh, we're just setting the value there. And then uh, after that, the um, a ser processing uh, API is invoked which is the uh, one which is very latent. So this is the, this is the one which is the upstream service, uh, upstream API. <coughs> so what it's going to do is, it's first going to uh, want to extract the user ID out of the context which is passed to it. From that, it tr um, tries to just invoke a uh, process event. Now, a process event is a go func uh, inside another go routine because this is a highly, could be a highly latent uh, 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 process. Uh, so it takes its own sweet time processing the event based on the user ID. It could, it could uh, uh, take the user ID in order to log it or to use it for some other uh, purposes. And it's when, once it's done with processing whatever came to it, it's going to return uh, some value into a channel. And that channel I've done, um, I, I only have a, Buff, it's a single buffer channel. And uh, so what the main function is going to do is it's going to invoke select. Now the select is invoked on two channels. First coming from the context and the second coming from the latent operation. So between these two, whichever gets hit first, either the done channel is closed, which could actually mean uh, the deadline expired or uh, in some other uh, process sort of decided to cancel it. But in, in our particular example, it's going to be uh, the deadline expiring. So the de let's assume the deadline expired. It's just going to say, hey, I don't care about P anymore. I'm just going to return. Or you hear back from P before uh, the deadline expires, and then you say, hey, OK, great. I got something on P. Here it is. So you're well within your time, and you ensure that it's still relevant. So this is like a basic example. There are more uh, examples that may be found on the blog's uh, sp post written by Samir. So I'll just summarize what we just talked about. Uh, we said uh, context library is great for handling multiple concurrent requests in a distributed system. 
It uh, helps in flow traceability. It helps in fingerprinting. It, hel it, it makes sure that whatever is uh, serviced is done so in a timely manner. It's time sensitive. Uh, you may also want to pass cancel, uh, uh, pr uh, cancelable uh, uh, information, cancel cancelable requests upstream. Uh, you might uh, also want to send some context-specific information in the value. So I will uh, sort of just uh, walk you through some points you might want to look out for when you're evaluating this package. Uh, so uh, we tried using this in so uh, its its uh, its use case is very well known in cases where the uh, requests are blocking requests. Uh, however, uh, it's it still uh, doesn't have too many examples where the requests are non-blocking; they are asynchronous, and um, it is adv ad uh, advised that you do not stash uh, context in structures, etc because it sort of just tr becomes more and more complex. And very easily, uh, you start stashing stuff. Uh, your management becomes uh, difficult. You don't know at what point your context is released. And uh, you know it gets released with, with the scope of wherever you're stashing it. And then very easily, for a larger complex systems, it starts blowing up. And it becomes uh, really complex. So you want to evaluate the use of the context library precisely in your scenario, pin it down to where you think it's going to uh, sort of really serve your use case and just use it there. Try avoiding stashing it elsewhere. Inter-process boundaries. Now this is a very uh, good one. In fact, there was a question on Reddit as well. Uh, so the, uh, the thing is that dumb channels are really channels. So when we talk about Using context across nodes or across uh, processes, uh, what exactly it, it, it doesn't really translate, does it? So uh, inter-process boundaries, it's actually non-trivial to be passing the done channel itself across processes. What could, what could you know, be potential workarounds? would be either to sort of have another uh, RPC uh, go say, hey, the dumb channel was closed on the other guy. You better close it at your, at your end as well. Or you might want to exp you know, sort of implicitly derive it, saying, uh, this is the deadline. And this is the deadline I would like you to sort of expire your um, uh, uh, request locally. So then both of them are looking at the same values. And uh, the, hopefully, it's going to expire at the same time in the future. Both of them catch the done signals l at their ends and process it, right? So there is no explicit done uh, channel uh, communication, but uh, it can be done implicitly. But you get the point. It's, it's non-trivial. Again, uh, like I said, make sure that you know the scope in which you're dealing. It's uh, sometimes not very easy to sort of just stash uh, context and have only a subtree removed uh, from the context tree. And querying, uh, make sure that you always hold the right uh, context node, because when deriving, it's very easy to sort of uh, miss what is a cancelable node and what is a, a value node. And sometimes you end up querying the wrong node and don't get the value. So, so uh, some, some high uh, level points to just keep in mind. Um, we experimented a f uh, uh, around a few use cases. Uh, for some, it worked out really well. For some, it didn't quite uh, pan out because uh, the code became complex. And so um, if you have specific uh, queries and uh, things, feel free uh, to drop me an email. We can discuss it more. And uh, yeah, and uh, Samir gave me a lot of inputs. I'd like to acknowledge uh, his, his help uh, as well. So thank you all. Um, and I will open it up for questions now. Thank you. Questions? Uh, we'll have to keep this brief. We just have maybe three or four minutes left in the slot. So uh, uh, when you talk about upstream and APIs. I'm sorry, I miss. Oh, OK. okay. I'll just, uh, sort of. So when you talk about upstream and APIs in your uh, this, uh, presentation, sure. uh, I was thinking more of uh, you know uh, different services, You know, service A making a call to a service B, which is running on a different node entirely. And secondly, uh, APIs means like HTTP APIs is what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So is this thing usable in that scenario as well, or 
what it is it is it yes so in uh, so uh, help me understand this when service a is making you know had created an, a context for example uh, request tracing is one use case sure. in which i assigned a request id to a particular call that i'm making then the other service is supposed to you know generate the context back from the request it got right i made a http request the uh, up the service b which received that request mm -hmm. should be able to generate the context back uh, okay so you would typically pass context t while invoking your request right so when you're uh, you know uh, the other service it mm -hmm. might be interested in the request id right that's how the whole chaining would work sure. i believe that from b to c c to d Correct. all these microservices will be able to extract that request id mm -hmm. right so that means that when things are going on the wire mm -hmm. uh, the whole context is somehow converted to you know something either in the body or in the header of the request mm -hmm. uh, do you have any idea how that is context is always passed typically uh, I it is recommended it always be passed as the first parameter in the api that you're invoking in the in the request that you're invoking right so it's uh, it is passed as an argument explicit argument uh, uh, ex explicit parameter in the um, rpc or in the api that you're using so it becomes a part of your request the other uh, end um, will pick up this request it already has the context node it interprets the information exactly as sent by uh, the downstream uh, service and fetches the request ID or whatever information you've packed and, and uses it, right? So you don't have to really pass it as an optional argument or, or you just give it as an explicit context. So on the interface itself, you define that context is sent as a parameter. Okay, so that becomes part of my request body. And your request body. Yeah. So yes, yes. Uh, An identifier. It's not optional, it's uh, mandatory. Okay, so there it would be having some wire format, like some serialization format. Uh, so serialization is uh, whatever you have to do any which ways for okay. uh, sending pack structures, right? You use go uh, encoding, gob okay. structures, right? And the interpretation is going to be the like same maybe on. JSON. Anything at all yeah. in this world. You just encode it in the right format. You always make sure you decode it in, in whatever format you expect it in. Thank you. Thank sure. I have a quick quick question. So does it uh, work with HTTP protocols? We are like yeah, absolutely. Example. I think, in okay. fact, it, it started off uh, in the HTTP use case. Um, so yeah, that's Thank exactly you. what it started off with. Um, uh, audience, I think we're going to have to close questions now because sure. we're out of time. But please don't hesitate to come up to Smita and catch her offline. Yes, please. During the session. Thank you very much. Thank you.